Hey, hey, it's me, Maggie J. Today with a long video about a show called Rutherford Falls. This title is available through the Peacock app, and I've got to admit right now, it's more than a bit sad that you have to pay for access to the full season because this is such a good story. I really wish it was free for everyone. Because I like this show so much, I don't want to completely ruin it for anyone that is interested. I have written a few paragraphs about the show that is, hopefully, spoiler free. So Rutherford Falls is the story of a man who lives on his ancestral land, is pretty much the last of his kind in this area, and all he has left is the house he lives in that doubles as a museum displaying the aging relics of his heritage. Nobody cares to uphold the traditions his ancestors instilled generations ago. Go. They're violating the charter, a potentially legally binding agreement. The Minishanka tribe is using his words to sue him and eventually, okay, small spoiler, take a whole bunch of his land away legally. I really can't wrap up this review the way that I want to if I don't tell you that he's losing his land. Anyway, the mayor and the townspeople don't really care and kind of probably think they might be better off without this guy and his charters and bylaws. So he's basically powerless while facing local government regulation, corporate wheelings and dealings, legal logistics, and has very little support from the members of the community. It's very much a modern day reversal of what happened to so many tribes due to westward expansion. A white guy is losing control over all his family has to an indigenous nation who is using the legal system and corporate negotiation to push him out or make him a puppet. And local government isn't interested in helping or protecting him at all, despite his ancestors being responsible for the foundation of the town they enjoy today. I found an interesting push and pull while watching this because on the surface it seems easy to tell Nathan to knock it off and stop beating his head against the wall trying to argue for why a statue that stands in the middle of a roadway shouldn't be moved, but the charter is the charter and if you don't uphold some of it, why uphold any of it, right? Slippery slope and all that, eventually none of the stipulations make sense, and this old rag that Rutherford Falls was built upon means nothing. Apply that to the indigenous struggle of today, plenty of natives are fighting for causes and against ideals that most people would say, you're in the minority, you're such a small little voice, just be quiet and get out of the way of progress, but should they actually shut up and move on? Hell no, not when something is important. So I grew to appreciate Nathan's unending spirit and motivation. Overall, I give it four out of five stars. Solid story, excellent layering, and mostly good timing. There are some things that don't quite make sense and scenes and characters that I could do without, but there are a lot of appearances from people who were in Reservation Dogs, amongst other titles. There's top-notch characters and attitudes, along with some unexpected love connections and tons of jokes about being native, which I love. Janice Schmiding as Reagan is a treasure and I kind of feel bad about what I might have said about her in the Reservation Dogs review. I would be her friend in this show, definitely. If you can watch, I highly recommend. If you cannot watch, I still highly recommend. Peacock is like six bucks a month and you get access to so many other titles, it's definitely worth it, even for just one month. But if you just cannot, I don't want you to miss out on the story being told here. So I have gone through and written a little recap of each episode and that is what the rest of this episode is, along with some of my opinions. So this concludes the spoiler-free portion of the show. Thank you for watching. Now, on to the good stuff. So, Rutherford Falls is a little town located in upstate New York named after a guy who fought off a swarm of possum and claimed this valley as his own. That man was Lawrence Rutherford and 13 generations of his family would live there in that town. Unfortunately for the Minishanka tribe who already lived in that valley, the Rutherfords would not make their existence easy. Over time, the power of the Rutherford name has dwindled and most of them have moved on to other places, except for Nathan Rutherford, who the mayor calls a town mascot and has converted his ancestral home into a museum dedicated to the history of his family. His mission is to ensure the preservation of the town charter, no matter how useless or dumb the decrees have become over time. So he serves to be a thorn in the side of local government every chance he gets. 
Reagan Wells has been Nathan's best friend since they were kids. She is Minishanka. She works at the cultural center located inside the casino and nobody in the tribe respects her or likes her much because she ran off to college instead of marrying Ray, the guy she dated all through high school. The mayor of the town, Deidre Chisenhall, hails from a rival family of the Rutherfords and Nathan thinks she only became the mayor to spite him and destroy his family legacy because she's a Chisenhall. She likes to refer to herself as the first black mayor of Rutherford Falls like it's a whole title. Bobby Yang is Nathan's assistant slash intern who's actually a high school student trying to beef up his college resume and stay away from the school as much as he can. Terry Thomas is the manager of the Running Thunder Casino. Josh is a reporter who comes to town to do a story about the town's statue, which is the perfect place to start talking about the individual episodes of season one. In episode one, the opening scene, a woman crashes her car into said statue that is located in the middle of the street because the town charter says the statue must stand on the exact spot the charter was signed. The driver says, well, that's stupid. And it is. Who put the road here where the statue is supposed to stand? I blame the city planner for this. Nathan gives a tour of the museum to Miss Fish's class. Miss Fish nearly chokes to death on some astronaut ice cream while trying to flirt with Nathan, but he gives her no play because as he tells Reagan, she doesn't get it. He can't explain what it is, but he can tell who does and doesn't get it. And he doesn't have time for those who don't. Speaking of someone who doesn't get it, Mayor Chisenhall is finally going to move the statue, no matter what the charter says, it's a safety hazard. Even Nathan's brother does doesn't get it and tells him to let them move the statue. Meanwhile, Reagan is meeting with Terry Thompson at the casino, asking for more money to improve the cultural center that most people think is a gift shop. He says they don't have money for that, but invites her to be a part of his running lightning initiative that he can't tell her anything about, but she agrees to be ready to work on that in about three to five years. By the end of the episode, Reagan manages to talk Nathan into moving the statue to his museum and creating a new wing about it. And he can make a new video, his favorite thing. But when they have a town meeting to announce the move, the town doesn't care. They want to know what is being done about the real problems they're having currently. This gets Nathan fired up and he goes on a rant about how the people of the town are ungrateful boobs. So you know it wound up on the internet in like two minutes, which kicks off a chain of events that it takes the rest of the season to deal with. Terry Thomas calls a meeting of the board at the casino. Deidre turns the town's ire into a bit of support for herself by further yelling at Nathan and egging on the crowd. A woman who works at Rutherford Inc., a big time corporate conglomerate, whatever, whatever, whose mascot is the Big Larry statue, is pissed that Nathan is causing her troubles again. And an NPR reporter takes an interest in the town behind the viral video. Episode 2, Buckhart Lodge. Terry Thomas stops by the Rutherford Museum in episode two to encourage Nathan to keep up his fight for Big Larry, which feels like an errand that serves Terry more than Nathan. But Nathan's all fired up about this support and decides to go on a podcast to discuss the issue further instead of doing nothing like the corporate PR lady wants him to do. By the end of the podcast, we learn about Buckhart Lodge, where the powerful people of the town used to gather to hash out their issues. We also learned this podcast host has a number of outdated racist opinions that he justifies with historical anecdotes. One of his favorites being that Nathan's family, the Rutherfords, were responsible for the first white baby born in the region. The host tries to get Nathan to agree with him. Aren't you proud of your ancestors, aka all those white people? Nathan wants to edit out the white baby part, but it's a no-go from the host, unless Nathan would like to go to Buckhart Lodge. Nathan agrees, and the next thing you know, these two are battling it out like gladiators, which is apparently how all the esteemed leaders handled their issues around these parts. Lucky for Nathan, this guy passes out from the exertion and the alcohol, so no one gets hurt. But Nathan and Bobby are both very soft, almost useless people on their own, so they've got to call someone competent enough and strong enough to help them clean up the cabin and get this drunk out of here. 
Meanwhile, over at the casino, Reagan confronts Terry about why he's encouraging Nathan. She thinks Terry is nothing but a shark, so there's no way what he's doing could be good for anyone else but him. Terry tells her he's found out why everyone hates her. Remember that guy she left to go to school? Well, she left him the night before their wedding, after everyone had already come together to make food and weave baskets. It was financially damaging to some people, aka Ray's mother. So now nobody likes her, but Terry's got a solution. She can go with him to visit some council members, so she's seen with someone respectable. However, everywhere they go, all she does is chores. <laughs> Terry volunteers her to chop wood, caulk a bathroom, teach a yoga class, call some bingo, help at a food truck. She fucking hates it at first. But Terry tells her, you got to do the work if you want to get the job done. That's how he got to be the person he is and how he stays that way. Someone the community trusts to lead them and can count on at the same time. What an inspiration, Terry. But they're not done yet. Terry stops at Ray's mother's house because she's like the lead clan mother of the council. Reagan begs Terry, do not bring up the wedding. But once they're inside, she can't stop talking about the wedding that never happened. And then Terry puts the second part of his plan into action. Well, I assume it was part of his plan. It worked out perfectly. Okay, so Ray's mother, Ray Ann, is going to vote no on whatever proposition it is that Terry is circulating. Probably mostly because he brought a quote-unquote homewrecker to her house. Reagan makes a joke about being a, technically a double-wide trailer wrecker and Terry snaps at her. He calls her a cold snake who has no sense of community or family values and that she never deserved Ray. Pretty harsh words, but they're exactly what Rayanne wanted to hear slash see happen. Tell her it's her fault Ray married a white woman, she tells Terry. <laughs> and, he, and he does. What else, he says, knowing his plan is working. He's helping all three of them by doing this. Whatever you call this, where one person takes advantage of someone's guilty conscience to gain favor with others, but raises both of their reputations in the process. When they return to the casino, Reagan is mad at Terry for all he's put her through. But once he explains that he's given her an ending so everyone can finally move on from that open wound of what she left behind, she asks why he's helping her. He says he thinks that she might be a shark too, and he wants her on his team. So this is all part of Terry's long-term plan. And then Reagan gets a call from Bobby that he may have witnessed a murder. Of course, she rushes right over to help, and while in the Buckhart Lodge, she finds a pot from ancient times that magically finds its way to a display case inside the cultural center. Then Terry announces the tribe is going to sue Nathan Rutherford. Episode 3, Aunt Ida's 90th Birthday. Episode 3 opens with an impassioned journalist giving a speech about a story he wants to cover that's about a town, but also about everything. His boss does not care, but he winds up in Rutherford Falls anyway, at the same time that Nathan is away, celebrating his great aunt Ida's 90th birthday party. Nathan has left Reagan in charge of the museum, so she is the one Bobby calls to deal with Josh the reporter and his many questions about Big Larry and the town. She and Bobby agree to make it seem like there is no story here, but he's like centaur hot, so they don't totally trust themselves to keep their mouths shut. <laughs> After a very dull tour of the museum, a tour of the town, a sampling of the finest milkshakes from a bar, and finally seeing the Big Larry statue with his own eyes, the reporter finally says he doesn't think there's anything story worth here, so he'll head on out. But the next train isn't for another four hours, so he and Reagan go back to the bar to enjoy some more adult beverages. They find out they both went to Northwestern. They take a trip to the cultural center. She tells him about the Minishanka basket tradition and her wedding that didn't happen. They've been hitting it off all day, so it's very natural when they kiss in the harsh blue casino lights. Meanwhile, Nathan arrives at his brother's house, 
full of other Rutherfords, but none of them have as much enthusiasm for the heritage as he does. Except for maybe this new guy named Steve who's recently married in and whose real family just sucks. He spills the beans that Nathan's brother does is selling the house here that some so-and-so Rutherford built in 1821, which breaks Nathan's heart. Nathan tries making a video about the family's favorite memories of the house, but it backfires spectacularly because nobody loves this place and they don't care if it gets sold. He and does later argue again, does holds firm saying he doesn't want to see Nathan waste his life trying to keep the traditions and legacy alive, which further hurts Nathan's feelings. When he leaves, Nathan is not any happier about the sale, but he sent does a video that is actually a scavenger hunt slash tour of where some of their brotherly memories were made. And in the end, he tells him if he wants to sell the house, Nathan is okay with his decision. To wrap up this episode, Nathan arrives home and is promptly served by one of those people who deliver court orders and summonses and whatnot. Reagan and Josh spent the night together and her mission to deter him away from any potentially scandalous stories about Rutherford Falls, Big Larry, or Nathan Rutherford was damn near successful. But the next morning, here comes Nathan himself ranting about being sued by the Minneshonka Nation for what he said during the speech he gave, which is exactly what Josh came here to find out. So now they are both very excited to meet each other. After all that hard work Reagan put in, hanging out with this hot guy all day and entertaining him all night, Nathan will never understand what she sacrificed for him, only for this to happen. So sorry, Reagan. <laughs> Episode 4, Terry Thomas. Episode 4 is called Terry Thomas, so I can only assume it's about Terry Thomas. This one is going to be kind of a long summary. So many great things happen in this episode. We start off with a flashback to 1981, even before I was alive. And here's little boy Terry selling lemonades in front of this bakery. The owner of the bakery makes a deal with Terry to sell all his day-old brownies, and he'll give Terry 20% of the profits. When it comes time to pay, the business owner pays him $2 instead of the $6 he's owed. The shop owner blames overhead and rent and says, some could say you owe me for letting you operate here, which teaches Terry many lessons. The next time we see him, he's making his own brownies at home and selling his wares in front of a beauty store. Obviously, he's been a natural entrepreneur since way back, so when he notices his daughter Maya spends a lot of time doing beadwork, he encourages her to sell it. She says it's just a fun hobby that helps her relax and spend time with her grandma, but he just can't understand that way of thinking. At work, Reagan confronts Terry again, this time about suing Nathan. We meet his new assistant, Jess, played by Devery Jacobs, who is also Alora Dannon from Reservation Dogs, who's named after the baby in Willow. I love this girl, but this character she's playing is dumb as hell and shallower than a Petri dish. It's adorable. Josh comes in to meet with Terry, and we learn even more about this enigma that is Terry Thomas. He wanted to be a musician, but it didn't really work out for his band, Rage Fuel. That sounds exactly like Soundgarden. So he's wound up in this position, being the face of the lawsuit for the tribe, because, spoiler alert, he's a bit of a talker. <laughs> Josh has done his research, though, and suing Nathan Rutherford aligns perfectly with some quotes from Terry that were printed in Indian Gaming Quarterly. Oof, barbs out from Josh. Jess interrupts to announce Nathan and Reagan have showed up, which gives Terry a convenient out from a thorny question from Josh. Nathan is upset about being sued, asking why, and Terry explains the Rutherfords were supposed to give goods of appreciation to the Minishanka every year in perpetuity. Nathan agrees that bit was merely ceremonial, but if you remember back to the ungrateful boob speech, Nathan claimed the document was legally binding. Hence, nothing is ceremonial and the Rutherfords are going to pay what they owe. Nathan would like only certain parts of the document to be lawful, which sounds like contract remorse, and I am fully behind Terry Thomas here. Let's let the lawyer sort out the jimble from the jumble and y'all see yourselves out. He's got an interview from NPR to finish, but he doesn't finish the interview. He tells Josh to wait. 
His son has a lacrosse game. He'll finish the interview after that. <laughs> Straight up power play from Terry. Terry's wife, Renee, is a savage in all the best ways. She don't take no shit. She's very outspoken. She's vicious when it comes to her kids. And I'm pretty sure she is Auntie B from Reservation Dogs. <coughs> like Terry says, for your own good, do not shush this woman. <laughs> Between threatening the refs and her son throughout this lacrosse game, she lays into Terry about him putting pressure on Maya about selling her beadwork. After the game, Terry hands out extra money for his wife's expensive bologna she likes and for his son to buy a new lacrosse stick for his friend, whose is looking a bit ragged, and reminds his son to tell him it was an extra that he had, you know, so it doesn't feel like pity. What a guy. He's still not giving up on the daughter selling her beadwork, though. He offers to pay her to make 20 pieces, and of those, he will sell 15 of them and put the money away for her. She asks why he's so obsessed with money. Because literally everything costs money, he tells her. And from the lesson we learned from that story from 1981, it's a big damn deal to Terry Thomas. And then he returns to his office to finish his interview. I'm including way too much detail about this episode, but it was such a good one. I just want to talk about it. Anyway, during the second half of the interview, Nathan and Bobby roll into Terry's office laden with bags of corn chips, popcorn, and fur coats, enough to satisfy the terms of the agreement signed 400 years ago. Josh is witness to this entire exchange, which definitely helps the article, I'm sure, but Terry rejects the offer, and he is completely correct. Corn and fur used to be staple items. They could be sold at a premium because of how necessary they were, so the idea that fur coats and corn chips of the modern realm would be equivalent is ridiculous. Terry says the Minishankar are owed the equivalent of $350 million, and that is what they will hold out for. Nathan threatens him with a team of corporate lawyers from Rutherford, Inc., which is exactly what Terry wants to happen. So he encourages Nathan to just to do that. Josh questions Terry after witnessing this exchange between him and Nathan, reminding Terry almost no tribes have won similar suits, so why does he think he should carry on? Terry shuts off the reporter's voice recorder and tells him a little bit about indigenous people. The seven generations metric is the idea that what we choose to do now should always be to ensure that our people and ways will thrive seven generations from now. And everything that Terry Thomas does is to ensure the success of his nation. He's learned how to play this game from a young age and he will not stop until his nation has taken back everything that was stolen from them. With no time to process, Terry turns the recorder back on, wishes Josh the best and offers to be available anytime. Wow, what a scene. Michael Gray Eyes is amazing in this role. He later meets with the board asking to include Rutherford Inc. in the lawsuit because of the threats Nathan made earlier, using them to protect himself from the lawsuit. This is where the real money is going to come from because what can the tribe possibly get from Nathan Rutherford himself, the individual? Everything he has belongs to the estate and you know that's locked up tighter than Fort Knox. So things are potentially looking good for the Minishanka. Terry is finally getting into position to help his people in a big way. Episode 5, History Fair. Today in Episode 5, Nathan and Reagan are judges at the History Fair. Terry Thomas and Mayor Deidre Chisenhall are both in attendance and there seems to be some kind of beef between them that they are not going to let interfere with the children's event. It'll play out through the court, Terry says. Later, while the mayor is giving a speech to the people outside the fair, Terry steps up with his own microphone to do a little Minishanka land acknowledgement where he launches into a whole speech in the Mohawk language that's sprinkled with some very strategic English words that don't necessarily put Mayor Chisenhall in the best light if you're only listening to the English part of the speech. The judging of the fair goes pretty well until the judges see a video production about indigenous representation. It's informing and touching and makes all three judges tear up. But in the end, it's revealed it was made by Spencer Vanderslice, a straight up white kid. Before finding out this information, it was obvious this was the winner, but knowing who made it makes Reagan pause and not want to vote for this video to win. The judges meet with the kid who says all of the right things to make Reagan's apprehensions crumble, but he 
basically trashed the Rutherford, so now Nathan doesn't want to vote for him, and neither Reagan nor Nathan will let the third judge say anything. So their celebratory dinner at P.F. Chang's will have to wait a bit longer. <laughs> Terry and the mayor's assistants get together and they insist they bury the hatchet of whatever it is between these two. We find out that Terry owns an Airbnb that the mayor rented for her brother who threw up in the jacuzzi skimmer and used all of the kitchen towels to try to solve the problem. Terry mocks her for using the first black mayor of Rutherford Falls phrase too much and basically calls her a mad black woman. She insinuates that he is a tricky Indian, so they both know they should stop any time now. Hoping that a final judgment would end the fair and save them from having to keep being in the same room together, the mayor goes into the basement where the judges should be deliberating, but she finds that they have all gone to P.F. Chang's and ordered all of the food, and they're going to need at least another hour to deliberate. With no other choice, these two warriors level with each other. Deidre admits her brother is a fuck up. Terry admits if he were the first native mayor, he wouldn't shut up about it either. So maybe they shouldn't work against each other. They shake hands and maybe have laid the groundwork for an amicable relationship between the tribe and local government. Hooray! Meanwhile, over at P.F. Chang's, Bobby has arrived and basically destroyed any credibility his competitors had by showing the judges the flaws in each of the other projects. Bobby's film, by the way, was a clip show that only said good things about being America, but it just used inspirational phrases and imagery to make you feel good, but it didn't really have a point. It says nothing and offends no one is the argument he makes, and with no other options, the judges take it to the kitchen to bother the staff. After reviewing all of the evidence, they all discuss as a group and decide to give the award to the non-problematic film from Bobby, simply because it is non-problematic and won't bite any of them in the professional butt. Congratulations, Bobby Yang! Episode 6, Negotiations. And in Episode 6, we are back to talking about moving the Big Larry statue. The mayor is still not open to negotiation, despite the six ideas Nathan brought to the table as alternatives. After being shut down at City Hall, Nathan gets a phone call from the PR lady from Rutherford, Inc., who is sending a lawyer to deal with the lawsuit between now them, the corporation, and Nathan Rutherford, who is an honorary non-voting member of the board, i.e. not important at all, and the Minishanka Nation. So there's all this hubbub about the lawyers that are on their way, but when they show up, they are less than expected. It's just one guy, which both sides know means Rutherford Inc. isn't taking this seriously enough. Bobby talks Nathan into just rolling with it, so they all go to the meeting with Terry and the counselors. This hotshot lawyer tries to show off using a bowl of candy as a demonstration item, showing them how much the company is willing to pay the Minishanka Nation to go away. Terry pours the whole bowl of candy onto this guy's head. This inexperienced lawyer Blake Jensen who went to Harvard where there's a Jensen Hall and now works at his uncle's law firm. Terry basically tells him to send the real fucking lawyers up here to deal with me. This makes lawyer boy sad because Terry's being mean to him and even Bobby calls this guy a little bitch. Once they're all gone, Jess is in the boardroom cleaning up all the candy Terry dumped all over the lawyer guy and tells him, that was so badass, when people hear you turn down three million dollars, oh, imagine how pissed they're gonna be. Terry tells her that's why you need to keep this a secret. And she agrees, but can you really trust her? She's gossiper number one around here. And this is big gossip. But also, my nation owns some casinos. $3 million shouldn't be that big of a deal for a nation to turn down in upstate New York. Just my opinion. I could be very wrong. $3 million is a whole lot compared to $0, which is a potential outcome here, so there's that. Meanwhile, Wayne and Sally have set up a donation drive for the Cultural Center, aka put up a Facebook post asking people to donate what they can to Reagan because she's in need of everything. <laughs> Aw, how thoughtful. Now there's a big pile of junk in the cultural center and Wayne and Sally think they've done a good deed. <laughs> 
hilarious. While Reagan and Josh are sorting through the junk, Terry's daughter Maya comes by and drops off some of her beadwork. She is very humble, saying, these are just emojis, but maybe they'll inspire a future Minishanka girl to make something, which is the whole reason for the cultural center. What a win! Josh further encourages Reagan to explore the stories behind some of the junk she was given. And later on, it is time for the unveiling of the new cultural center exhibits. But the event is broken up by the sound of a helicopter landing in the parking lot. These are the lawyers they've all been waiting for. Episode 7, Rutherford, Inc. Episode 7 picks up right where 6 left off. Five lawyers and the PR rep from Rutherford, Inc. exit the helicopter and are escorted inside by Terry's assistant, Jess. Terry's picking out his accessories from the safe inside his office, settling on the bear paw medallion and a big silver cuff so he can make him feel guilty and jealous. <laughs> In the conference room, one of the Rutherford, Inc.'s young lawyers can't stop saying the word Indian and... It's awkward. Terry ultimately gets to the point. Nathan Rutherford has claimed to be part of Rutherford, Inc., so now they are also responsible for the amount of money that is owed to the Minishanka people. Rutherford, Inc. forces Nathan to make a statement about how he is not part of or affiliated with anyone of importance with Rutherford, Inc. Despite the company being founded by his family, they lost control of it long ago, and it only happens to share his name at this point. He tears up a bit while saying this, and I'll admit it's got to suck having to put into an official legal brief that you are nothing and no one. But Terry isn't done arguing his case yet. He brings in the podcast professor, remember the drunk guy, <laughs> and tells the lawyer the Minishanka have agreed to publish his book about the ancestral Rutherfords and how they made deals they didn't honor and ruined lives all around them. The lawyers don't think the book is going to cause Rutherford Inc.'s stock to tank, but that's not the goal here. Even a slight drop in stock price is a lot of money that just disappears. But if Rutherford Inc. would sell the Minishanka an amount of land, they'd drop the suit and shelve the book. The lawyers look very willing to take this deal, but Nathan notices part of the land they're asking for is where his museum stands and pretty much encompasses all of his family's property without any power to do anything except protest. We can only wait and see if Rutherford Inc. is willing to do this and save their own face and potentially a lot of money. Meanwhile, at the Cultural Center, Reagan is approached by an elder woman who tells her she is so proud of what Reagan has done here. It is a very touching moment for her and Josh shares in her feelings of excitement and pride. She then immediately turns her attention to her phone so she can tell Nathan all about this moment and try to cheer him up after his meeting that must have been tough for him. Aw, poor Josh. Later at Nathan's house, he is super depressed about possibly losing his home and museum, but Reagan comes up with the bright idea for them to designate the house a historical landmark so nothing too crazy could happen to it. They've just got to find evidence of a historical event taking place inside the house. Bobby finds some historical events in the professor's manuscript that sends Nathan and Reagan to Great Aunt Joan's house, not the same Great Aunt who had the birthday party at the beginning. Great Aunt Joan just has a garage full of junk. You know, with a name like Rutherford Falls, I find it real weird. There's this whole other house in New Jersey that Nathan's brother lives in that is also built by a Rutherford from a million years ago and has a ton of things that are important to Nathan and the upstate property hidden within it. It's also weird that this house isn't already part of the historical register after being built or inhabited by the town's founder or one of the mayors or so many of the mayors or whatever. And it's thirdly weird that so many of Nathan's family items and records and things that should probably belong in a museum setting are just casually located elsewhere, not in the museum. Weird. Aunt Joan isn't thrilled to see Nathan at her house, asking to dig through her old shit again because she hates it, and she has already told him he could have all her shit when she dies. Reagan promises to keep him away from her for a whole year if she would let them in right now, and Joan begrudgingly agrees. 
In the garage, they dig around a bit, and Reagan finds this whole cabinet full of real old, real authentic Minashanka items. Nathan tells her she won't be able to take any of that out of here, so don't even worry about it. Go check those file cabinets, because that's what he needs from her right now. And if she doesn't start to get upset about her best friend continuously making her a third or fourth priority, I'm going to be real mad about it. She goes to the bar to vent to Josh, who actually points out this disparity between her and Nathan's relationship. And if she doesn't start realizing that Josh is who she should be focusing on, I'm going to be real mad about it. So she heads over to Nathan's to tell him she's going to ask Joan to give those Minishanka items back to the tribe. But Nathan is very, very drunk and thinks what's happening to him is the most unfair thing that has ever happened. He can't believe the Minishanka and some lawyers are negotiating around him for the ownership of what he thinks rightfully belongs to him and his people. Ugh, so unfair. Why is your history so much more important than mine, she asks. And unable to answer, they go their own separate ways, angrily. Reagan goes to see Terry and says she is all in on running lightning. If he gives her the money, she's asked for the cultural center, and he agrees. Mayor Chisenhall calls Nathan to tell him she's coming over so they can figure out this Terry problem together. Good luck, girl. He is drunk as hell. Episode 8, Skoden. So in episode eight, very unexpectedly, we see that Reagan and Terry have flown to parts unknown for a gaming conference that nobody told us about. This is the day after she and Nathan had that argument, so this feels rushed and unexpected, but oh well. Mayor Chisenhall has showed up at the Rutherford Museum and is stuck dealing with a very hungover Nathan, trying to figure out how to not lose part of the town to the Minishanka tribe. The plan they come up with is a long shot that involves a ton of individual support from the townspeople, but it could work. At the town hall meeting, Nathan gives an impassioned speech about not moving the statue, mentions a number of instances where being in the way was the right way to be, and Mayor Chisholm Hall agrees with him. That sentiment spreads and the town council decides to let the issue be shelved for the time being. Later, Nathan and Deidre celebrate with a bottle of wine and get to talking about the feud between their families, which all sounds very silly in this day and age, but it brings these two together, and then they kiss, and then they spend the night together. And that was also unexpected. Nathan and Bobby come up with a plan to deface the statue to get more people on their side of the debate. And while washing the paint off of the statue, Nathan discovers some words etched into the collar of Big Larry's bronze shirt. He takes some photos to Rayanne, who translate the Minishanka words into English, and they say, don't trust Malmare. Malmare is a legend about a monster who came from across the ocean and wore a white mask and was obsessed with eating the poop of small children. She further tells him the legend is actually about Lawrence Rutherford, Big Larry himself, who might not have been a real poop eater, but was a real bastard to the Minishanka. He asks her if her knowledge is correct about her language, and she slaps the shit out of him. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the gaming con, Reagan is attempting to gather up all the swag she can, but Terry has appointed her to the associate director of the Running Thunder Casino, and he needs her to look professional. Throughout the trip, she meets more associate directors and finds they're all okay with their job, but this isn't what they set out to be, and it was only supposed to be temporary, but here they are so many years later, and she starts to rethink her position. Terry sits in on panel after panel, listening to other casino directors explain how they are raking in the cash with their innovative gaming systems, virtual reality slots, on-site marijuana dispensaries, and water parks. And he feels so far behind them and what they're offering. Reagan gives him a pep talk that inspires him to rise above all this that others have and figure out what is best for the Minishanka tribe. When they get back to town, they have a meeting with Nathan and Deidre about what they came up with. Reagan unveils Ye Old Rutherford Village, where the portion of town they want to buy will be transformed into a 1700s theme destination, resembling what Rutherford's Falls used to be, and it seems like a win for everyone involved. The Minishanka get that piece of land they wanted to buy, the town stays about the same size, this Ye Old Village will be mostly new construction and incorporate the Rutherford Museum and its lands and 
under the design, the casino gets a big expansion, including a standalone two-story cultural center, and the town gets an influx of new workers, then new visitors, which all means dollars for the town. Even the Rutherford Inc. name will likely get a big boost in public opinion. Only Nathan is opposed to this because he's still just a pawn amongst all of this. So you're going to take my land, but allow me to live on it according to your terms, he asks. Terry says, think of it as a fair and honest deal, which if you remember back to episode one, this is exactly how it was worded when Lawrence Rutherford struck up the deal with the Minishanka all those many years ago. Zing. Episode nine, Studis. We carry right on in episode nine. Nathan storms out of the conference room, very upset about being powerless and irrelevant when it comes to the future of him and his property. Reagan can't help but be a little bit upset as well. One, for having to see her friend go through this, and two, because she still doesn't fully trust that Terry will give her the cultural center they agreed on. But Terry shows her the beautiful new two-story building he intends for the cultural center that is located near the casino on the expansion property. Oops, I may have spilled the beans a little early in the last recap, but whatever. She loves it. She is all in. And Terry even gives her a blank check to go over to Aunt Joan's house to buy those Minishanka items she's got in her garage. Unfortunately, negotiations do not go well until Reagan pulls the Department of the Interior card along with the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act card along with the I have a blank check card and Aunt Joan surrenders immediately. Terry shows Nathan the costume they've designed for him to wear in ye old Rutherford Village, which is not historically accurate in the least. But Terry tells him, this is what is most acceptable by the kinds of people we expect to visit ye old Rutherford Village. So you've got to play the part. (laughs) While cleaning out the garage, Josh stumbles upon a letter he thinks is historical. So he reads it out loud. But it's a love letter from 1982 from a guy named Ronnie thanking Nathan's mother for naming their love child after his father. Meaning Nathan Rutherford is not actually a Rutherford. Oh my God. Is someone going to have to do a DNA test to prove their lineage? The horror. Dum, dum, dum. <laughs> Josh is looking at this revelation as a boon for his journalist career. He's chomping at the bit to write this story with the details he's uncovered, while Reagan is still trying to protect Nathan and tells Josh he can't do his job. I am not happy about this because, again, Josh is being expected to do what Reagan wants because doing his job might hurt Nathan. Never mind, this could be Josh's career-making article. Don't hurt my friend's reputation. How fucking sad. When Reagan goes to Nathan's to comfort him about the ye old Rutherford Village costume with P.F. Chang's in hand... He acts mostly like a dick, so she blurts out that he is not a Rutherford. Upset and disbelieving, he kicks her out after saying some particularly hurtful words and obviously is going to need some time to process this completely new information. Eventually, Does shows up to talk to Nathan and reminds him of a whole bunch of stuff that happened that makes so much more sense when you have more information but at the time just seemed like some odd details from their childhood. Ronnie D'Angelo is actually a guy from the bowling team who does absolutely believes is Nathan's father because of a letter he found stuck to the back of some documents that Nathan had hidden in Does's house many years ago from Ronnie to their mother about renouncing his paternity so Nathan's life would be easier. Nathan makes a big deal of being from a different bloodstock from his brother, but does is insistent that heritage doesn't really matter to him. So Nathan is alone in making a big deal of this. He calls Bobby to thank him and fire him from a dumb museum about a dumb family, then chains his car bumper to the Big Larry statue in an attempt to pull down the statue that stands in the middle of the road and very quickly loses his bumper. This does not deter our quasi-hero. He continues on, driving out of town as if he doesn't belong here. Episode 10, D'Angelo's. 
For most of the beginning of episode 10, Nathan is driving all over trying to clear his head and visit relatives who might be able to help him figure out who he is if he's not a Rutherford. It does not go well. Everyone he meets gives him a ter- Everyone he meets gives him terrible irrelevant advice. Are not Ru- Everyone he meets gives him terrible irrelevant advice are not Rutherfords or D'Angelo's or are suffering from Alzheimer's. But he carries on. Nathan Rutherford slash D'Angelo will figure out who he is if it takes all he has. After finding a restaurant with a food challenge where the winners are called Honorary D'Angelo's, Nathan takes part in that and wins, but then disgustingly pukes it all back up. It's fucking gross. Meanwhile, Terry Reagan and Wayne, the casino janitor, are all featured on a billboard to promote the casino, which further puts Reagan into a bad light as far as some of the tribe members are concerned, but pretty much only her. There's a whole Facebook group making posts against her. Apparently, the people are upset that Reagan, a city Indian, the unqualified cultural center leader, and now even more unqualified appointee to assistant director of the Running Thunder Casino, is going to be in charge of the proposed brand new two-story cultural center. There's a whole Zoom meeting about this where she tries to be accommodating to the masses, but eventually loses her patience and starts getting vicious with the people online. She winds up with 50% likes to dislikes, and Terry calls that a win. Nathan calls Reagan from the road, and she asks when he is coming home. He's not sure Rutherford Falls is his home anymore, since he doesn't have a house or a job there anymore. And he's not even a Rutherford, so it looks like he's going to keep on bumming around, trying to find himself. The credits roll and the song that's playing on the car's radio leads into an intro about a seven-part narrative featuring a town, a tribe, and a reckoning 400 years in the making. It's Josh, the NPR reporter, telling the story of Nathan Rutherford, Rutherford Falls, Rutherford Inc., the Minishanka tribe, and what's been happening over the last couple of months over in that neck of the woods. And that's the end of season one. I could talk a whole lot more about this, but I think this video is long enough. I'm also really sweaty. I got to turn the AC back on. Season two will be coming out very soon if I get this video done in time. So I'll likely be doing another review and recap of that one before too much longer, but who knows how long it'll take. So make sure to subscribe if you'd like to keep up with my very sporadic posting schedule and maybe leave a like if you did enjoy the content. It's not necessary, but as a small channel, I need all of the interactions I can get. So leave me a comment and tell me your favorite episode or if you have any questions about this season that maybe I could answer in another video. That is all that I have to say about this for now. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, y'all stay safe out there.